Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 40, he says, if you help him not, yet God has already helped him. Remember when those who disbelieved expelled him, the second of the two. The two were in the cave when he said to his companion, grieve not, truly God is with us. Then God sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him with unseen forces. And he made the word of those who disbelieved to be the lowest and the word of God to be the highest and God is mighty and wise. If you recall, my dear brothers and sisters, we were speaking about the Battle of Tabuk. After the, the conquest of Mecca, the Roman Empire decided that it wanted to invade Hijaz, the Arabian Peninsula. The Holy Prophet after conquering Mecca, receives intelligence that the Roman Empire is planning to invade the Arab lands. And the Holy Prophet would rarely disclose to his companions who they were going to be fighting and where the battle was, taking, was going to take place. He would rarely reveal any military details. But in this case, the Holy Prophet ﷺ informs his companions that they're going to travel to Tabuk, which is far from the city of Medina. It entails a long journey, and they will be fighting not against an Arab tribe. It's not going to be a, a battle that's going to be fought in the outskirts of Medina against one of the clans or one of the Arab tribes. Rather, this is the first time that the Muslims are being summoned to fight against a superpower. And therefore you find last week we looked at some of the verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how reluctant some of the companions were. They were unwilling. They were sinking towards the earth. They were unwilling to move and to embark on this expedition because it required them to leave Medina and travel a long distance. They knew that they were going to be fighting a formidable enemy. So there was a lot of reluctance. And it was during a time where when they were preparing to harvest their crops. So there was a fear for death, a fear of losing from an economic perspective. So many of the companions started to make excuses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens them, saying that you will be punished severely if you do not participate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers a possible objection that if Allah were to destroy them and punish them, maybe some of the companions would ask, would wonder, if Allah punishes us, Who's going to support the Prophet? How is he going to achieve salvation if it were not for our help? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the previous verse that we spoke about last week, he basically says that if you don't, illa tanfirun, ayah number 39, if you don't go forth, Allah will punish you. God will punish you with a painful punishment. And he will replace you with, another group of people and you will not affect God in the least and Allah has power over all things now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Muslims he's reminding some of the companions who believe who may think that they are indispensable that the Prophet needs them Allah gives them an example of when Rasulullah had no help and yet Allah Azza wa Jal still supported his prophet even when he was all alone when he had one person with him in the cave so the ayah says in la tansuruhu faqad nasarahu allah if you don't help him if you don't help rasulullah you're at loss 
because Allah has helped him before when he had when he had less support. In the ninth year after the Hijrah, Rasulullah has thousands upon thousands of companions. Allah is reminding them that there was a time when the Prophet had no support. And he only had one person with him in a cave. And you'll we'll find out very soon that even though that person was with him in the cave, the Prophet was essentially all alone. إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ If you don't help him, God has already helped him in the past. When did Allah help the Prophet? إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا When the disbelievers expelled him. They expelled him from where? When they expelled him from Mecca. Now, the Prophet ﷺ spent nearly 13 years in Mecca. Mecca was where he began his prophetic mission. Mecca was his birthplace. Why did the Prophet suddenly leave? Why was he expelled? After the death of Abu Talib especially, the Prophet became very vulnerable. It was the presence of Abu Talib that was really keeping the Prophet alive. Abu Talib was able to negotiate the safety of his nephew. But when Abu Talib passes away, the Meccans become emboldened. The Prophet's final supporter departs this world. Khadija passes away. Abu Talib passes away. And Quraysh decides to assassinate the Prophet. Prior to this, the Meccans were negotiating with Abu Talib. They would tell Abu Talib that, you know, please speak to your nephew. He's creating a lot of disturbance in Meccan society. If he seeks women, we'll give him the most beautiful women. If he wants wealth, we'll, we'll give him wealth. If he wants to rule over us, we'll make him a king. So Abu Talib was able to negotiate on behalf of the Prophet. He was a protection for the Prophet. Now that Abu Talib has passed away, they are now plotting to assassinate the Prophet. Now what they do is that because Arabian society, there is this law of revenge. If you kill one person from a tribe, that tribe will avenge that death. So Quraysh comes together and all of the clans come together and they appoint one person from each of the different clans within Quraysh to participate in the assassination of the Prophet. So if a group of people kill the Prophet, it would be nearly impossible for Bani Hashim to retaliate against all of the various clans within the tribe of Quraysh. Now, so think back to the Meccan period. So the Prophet has now lost Khadija and Abu Talib. There are roughly about a hundred Muslims who are in Mecca. Many of them had already left to Abyssinia. The Holy Prophet ﷺ, through revelation, he's informed of this plot to assassinate him. The Quraysh planned to surround his house, to besiege his house at night. And they were planning on cutting him into pieces while he was asleep in his bed. Rasulullah calls upon Ali ibn Abi Talib Now Ali ibn Abi Talib at this time was about 21 years old. He was very young. And he informs Amir al-Mu'mineen of the plot to assassinate him. And he requests from Ali ibn Abi Talib to sleep in his bed. He asks Ali ibn Abi Talib to sleep in his bed. If you read the narrations that speak about the, the conversation that takes place. So the Prophet requests Ali ibn Abi Talib to sleep in his bed. Amir al muminin is 21 years old. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he asks the Prophet, now put yourself in the shoes of Ali. There is a plot to assassinate 
the prophet. The prophet is asking you to sleep in his bed, to pretend to be the prophet. The first question that Ali ibn Abi Talib asks is what? He says, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Ya Rasulullah, will you be safe if I sleep in your bed? Subhanallah. He doesn't ask the Prophet, will I be safe? Is anything going to happen to me? How badly am I going to be injured? How many men are going to come? How many assassins are there? What time do you think they're going to come? He doesn't ask any of these questions. He doesn't ask, am I going to be safe? He says, Ya Rasulullah, are you going to be safe if I sleep in your bed? The Prophet says, yes. The narration say that when Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam, when he hears that the Messenger of God will be saved if he sleeps in the bed of the Prophet, Amir al-Mu'mineen goes down into sujood. He goes down into sujood. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes into prostration and he thanks Allah for giving him the tawfiq to be the one who saves the life of the Prophet. And this is why Allah reveals in the Quran a verse in praise of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There are those who sell their souls to gain the satisfaction of Allah. Wallahu bil ibad. Ali ibn Abi Talib decides to sleep in the bed of the Prophet. The Prophet leaves, he prepares to leave. Now it's important for us to note here that the Prophet had no plans of taking anyone with him. He was planning on escaping on his own. As the Prophet is leaving Medina, he suddenly sees Abu Bakr standing in the middle of the street. Now I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that what was happening to the Muslims in the last three years of the Meccan period, they were under sanctions. There, was, there were economic and social sanctions imposed on the Muslim community. The Muslims were essentially in hiding. They were hiding in the mountain hideout of Abu Talib. So the Prophet is leaving Mecca, he's escaping, and suddenly Abu Bakr is there. The Prophet ﷺ, he takes Abu Bakr with him. Now, the Shi'i narrative, our narrative, is that the reason why he takes him is because the Prophet saw that leaving Abu Bakr in Mecca, especially after he had seen the Prophet, would be a liability. And of course, brothers and sisters, when we mention these historical perspectives, our intention is not to offend anyone. Our intention is to share what we have understood from Islamic history, what we understand from the verses of the Quran. So it was very unusual for Abu Bakr, who was a Muslim at the time, who had you know, formally in, uh, accepted Islam at that time, for him to be standing in the middle of the street at a time where Muslims were hiding, they were afraid of persecution. The Prophet sees Abu Bakr and he takes him. Because if he leaves him, he may disclose to the Meccans where the Prophet is. So he takes him with him. And then they leave Mecca. Now, of course, the Meccans, they descend upon the Quraysh, they descend upon the house of the Prophet to assassinate him. And then they, they see that Ali ibn Abi Talib is in the bed of the Prophet. They, when they remove the cover from the bed, you can imagine how shocked they were to see that this is Ali, this is not the Prophet. 
So they, they try to pressure Ali ibn Abi Talib to reveal to them where the Prophet is. Even, and, the, and they start physically attacking Ali ibn Abi Talib. Some narrations say that parts of his body become swollen because they physically assault him to get information out of him. But Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib doesn't give them any information. The Prophet so there are assassins who are looking for the Prophet. The Prophet, instead of going in the direction of Medina, he goes in the opposite direction and he seeks refuge. He hides in a cave, a cave by the name of Thawr. Who's with the Prophet? Abu Bakr is with the Prophet. The Meccans, you know, led by Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan, what do they do? They hire manhunters. These are individuals who specialize. They're, they're what we would call today bounty hunters. They hire these manhunters to find and to search for the Prophet and to basically follow the footprints. So they arrive, the manhunters, they lead them in the same direction that the Prophet fled from. And they take them to the mouth of a cave. And the man hunters, they say that the, the footprints lead here. Abu Bakr and the Prophet, they were inside of the cave. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a spider to weave a web at the mouth of the cave and a bird to lay an egg in its nest. Now when the Quraysh reach the mouth, the entrance of the cave, they say that it's, there's no way that Muhammad is here. Because if he, if he entered the cave, he would have damaged the spider web. Now, if we go back to the ayah, how many people were in the cave? Two. Two are in the cave. When he said, meaning when the Prophet said to his companion, do not grieve. Now I have to pause here for a second. This ayah is perhaps one of the most important verses in the Qur'an in the minds of Sunni scholars to establish the virtue and the merit of Abu Bakr. In fact, Al-Fakhr razi in his tafsir, Al-Tafsir Al-Kabir, he says that this ayah presents 12 fawa'il for Abu Bakr. Now, I don't want to go into details, but one of the fawa'il that Fakhr Razi, the Sunni commentator, mentions is that Abu Bakr is referred to as the Sahib, the companion of the Prophet. And this is a virtue, this is a merit. Now, our scholars respond and they say that the word Sahib here does not denote any merit. Because if you look at the Qur'an, there are many examples of the usage of the word sahib, which refer to someone who's not even Muslim. So for example, if you go to Surah Al-Kahf, Surah number 18, Ayah number 37, Allah says, قَالَ لَهُ صَاحِبُهُ وَهُوَ يُحَاوِرُ When a mu'min, when a believer said to his non-believing friend, his non-believing companion. So in this ayah, the companion of a believer is what? A kafir. So the word sahib is used in Surah 18, ayah number 37, to refer to a kafir. There's no merit in it. If you go to Surah Al-Qamar, Ayah number 48, Yunus alayhi salam, he is called the sahib of 
the whale. Allah says, Fasbir in ayah number 48, Surah 68, Fasbir li rabbik. Be patient. Wala takun kasahib al And do not be like the companion of the whale. Who is the companion of the whale? Yunus alayhi salam, sahib al hut. So he's the sahib of an animal. There's no fadila here. If you go to Surah Yusuf, Surah number 12, ayah number 39, Yusuf alayhi salam, who's a prophet, who's an infallible prophet of God, when he was imprisoned by Zulaikha, he turns to his prison mates. And he says to them, Ya sahibay as-sijn. Oh my companions in prison. Does, is this a fadila? Is this a merit for those individuals? What does he say to them? A'arbabun mutafarriquna khayrun amillahu al-wahidu al-qahar. Are multiple gods who are in dispute with one another better than one god who is all-powerful? So here the ashab, of Yusuf are what? They're mushrikeen. So the word sahib in the Quran does not denote any merit. So for someone to say that this ayah refers to Abu Bakr as the sahib of the Prophet, and therefore this is a great distinction for Abu Bakr being called the sahib of the Prophet, the student of the Quran knows that the word sahib is not an honorific title. Because it's used in reference to non-believers. It's used in reference to even animals. Now I want you to see the contrast in Abu Bakr and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he slept in the bed of the Prophet, he himself, he says, I have never gotten better sleep in my life than the night that I slept in the bed of the Prophet. Now I ask you, brothers and sisters, if you're sleeping in the bed of the Prophet, in the bed of someone who is going to be assassinated, do you think you, think you and I would be able to even sleep? That would be the most sleepless, the most stressful night for us. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam, he says he actually fell asleep in the bed of the Prophet. It's not that he was just laying there nervously waiting for the assassins to arrive. He was so at peace that he actually fell asleep because there was nothing that was more comfortable for him than putting his life at risk to protect the Holy Prophet. So Ali is alone sleeping in the bed of the Prophet and he's at peace. He gets the best sleep of his life. Abu Bakr is with the Prophet in the cave. And the narrations say that he starts to cry when he hears the hooves of the horses, when he hears the unsheathing of the swords. Why does he begin to cry? Because in his mind, this is the end of my life, that I'm going to be killed. So he begins to cry. Now, you know, if you're crying and sobbing and the assassins are only a few meters away, obviously you don't want them to hear you. So the Prophet says to Abu Bakr, La tahzan, do not grieve. And some of the Mufassirin of the Quran, you know, because he was crying uncontrollably, they say that this La of the Prophet was not. He wasn't just saying no, this was a way when the Prophet says, La tahzan, he was commanding him to stop grieving. And the Prophet, through a miracle, he was able to make him mute because his sobbing would have allowed the assassins to hear that there were that they were present inside of the cave. La tahzan, inna Allah ma'ana. God is with us. Now, ma'ana, you may say that, is he saying that God is with me and Abu Bakr? First of all, some of the Mufassirin say ma'ana, 
the Prophet could be speaking about himself because it's very common in the Arabic language to use the plural when you're referring to one person. So for example, when you greet a fellow Muslim, you say, Assalamu Alaikum. You use the plural. You don't say, Assalamu Alaikum. So it could be the Prophet is saying that Allah is with us, meaning he's with me, or he's with me and Ali. And then what does Allah say? فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ Then God sent down his tranquility upon him. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And he supported him with unseen forces. So Allah sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him with unseen forces. Now, if you recall, brothers and sisters, in ayah number 26 of the same surah, of surah At-Tawbah, what did we read? During times of great difficulty and great hardship, Allah sends His tranquility upon who? Upon the Prophet and the believers. If you go to ayah number 26, as we covered a couple of sessions ago, a few sessions ago, Allah says, ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَىٰ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Whenever there is great hardship, Allah sends sakina, He sends tranquility to the heart of the messenger and to the hearts of the believers. So there are two groups who always receive sakina whenever there is a time of hardship, a time of difficulty. Allah sends sakina to the Prophet and He sends sakina to the Mu'mineen. If you go to Surah Al-Fatih, again Allah, He says, فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَىٰ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So Allah always sends tranquility to the prophet and to the believers in this verse allah says فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ allah sent tranquility upon him there are two people in the cave if allah sent tranquility upon rasulullah and abu Bakr. Allah should have said, فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِمَا But the dual pronoun is not used. There are two who are in the cave, but only one receives sakina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi always receives sakina during times of difficulty. As we read, in the other ayat, ثم أنزل الله سكينته على رسوله وعلى المؤمنين in ayah number twenty six of Surah At Tawbah as we read. So what is this verse saying about Abu Bakr? If he is among the mu'minin, he should have received the tranquility. This means that. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a distinction. You know, قالت in Surah, surah uh, Al-Hujurat, what does Allah say about the Bedouin Arabs who used to claim that they have Iman? قالت الأعراب آمنا They say, we believe, we have Iman. Allah says to the Prophet, tell them, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا You don't have Iman. وَلَكِنْ قُولُ أَسْلَمْنَا Say that you have submitted, you have taken the first step. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمْ وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Because there is still no iman in your hearts. So it's ironic, brothers and sisters, that the same ayah that our brothers from Ahlul Sunnah use to establish the merits of Abu Bakr, the Shi'i scholars use it to prove his lack of iman. Because if he was among the mu'mineen, he should have received the sakina. 
because Sakina always descends upon the Prophet and the believers. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا You know, there are some who say that, oh, Sakina was for Abu Bakr and the support from the unseen forces was for the Prophet. In the Arabic language, it doesn't work like that. The one who was given support with unseen forces is the same one who received Sakina. Because if, even if you read it in English, then God sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him. Meaning that him is the same as the him that was mentioned with respect to the sending down of Sakina. And Allah supported the Prophet with unseen forces. So Allah is telling these believers, He's telling the companions who are hesitant to join the Prophet in Tabuk, who think that Rasulullah, who think who think that the Prophet needs in them, Allah is telling them that I I supported my messenger when he was alone without any support in the cave. The Prophet doesn't need you. I helped him when he had no one. And if you don't want to support him, I will replace you with people who are eager and who are willing to support him. Now, who are these unseen forces? Some scholars, they say that these unseen forces are a reference to the Malaika. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported the Prophet with the help of angels. And it could be a reference to Ruh al-Qudus or Ar-Ruh. Allah doesn't really go into details about the nature of these unseen forces. So the one who is supported by unseen forces, he doesn't actually need you. Meaning he doesn't need the companions. It's for your own good to support the messenger. Allah made the word of the disbelievers the lowest. What is their word? The ideology of shirk. And Allah made his word the highest, meaning the word of tawheed, the ideology of tawheed. Because the Prophet ﷺ, preserving the Prophet is not just preserving an individual, it's preserving the institution of tawheed. The concept, the ideology of Tawheed. Wallahu Azizun Hakim. And Allah is mighty and He is wise. 